Welcome to the Bradenton area, on the Gulf Coast of Florida, where the easy pace of island life comes naturally in this coastal playground with endless white sand beaches, stunning natural preserves to explore, relaxing vibes all around, and it's a seafood lover's paradise. Plan to stay a while to explore vibrant downtown Bradenton with top-rated attractions like the Bishop Museum of Science and Nature, and discover this friendly community set along the Bradenton River Walk, where you'll find lots of surprises around every corner. Come lose yourself in the sun-drenched Gulf Coast and change your reality here in the Bradenton area. Discover Florida's West Coast in Bradenton, Anna Maria Island, and Longboat Key. Learn more at BradentonGulfIslands.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on where you are. Welcome to the third day of Global Conference on Services and Retail Management. It is our pleasure to welcome you to the third day with an amazing panel, editor's panel. I would like to introduce the moderator of this panel, Dr. Sertan Kabadayi. Welcome, Dr. Kabadayi. Thank you. Thank you, Jihan. I would like to introduce him to you, uh, Dr. Kabadayi is the professor of marketing at Fordham University, Gabelli School of Business. He conducts research primarily in the transformative service research field with an emphasis on improving well-being. Furthermore, he is doing research related to refugees and refugee integration into host countries. He has published in a variety of academic journals, including the Journal of Marketing, Journal of Service Research, Journal of Business Research, Journal of Public Policy and Marketing, Journal of Service Management, Journal of Services Marketing, Industrial Marketing Management, 
and psychology and marketing. He serves as the associate editor for Journal of Services Marketing, Journal of Consumer Marketing, and Journal of Creating Value. Dr. Kabadei, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Jehan, and thank you for the opportunity and invitation. It's my real pleasure to moderate today's panel with four great uh, colleagues um, that they will talk about the future of service research. So um, I would like to introduce them one by one so they can talk about their background uh, briefly before I start with my questions. First, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mariana Sigala. Mariana, can you please tell us briefly about yourself, your background, your research interests, please? Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. My pleasure to be with you and thanks for the invitation. Um, I have a dual interest and background um, or even three fields, let's say. I do research on, service, on the service um, literature and field. I specialize on technologies as well uh, as they are applied in the service field and that's why I publish in information systems and service journals as well. But then my industry context and specialization is tourism and hospitality. So um, as somebody can probably imagine, uh, as uh, I mentioned before, um, I have two disciplinary focuses and one industry specialization. Um, I've done a lot of research for those that they know me on technology applications, mainly social media marketing, um, CRM and revenue management, electronic distribution, um, a lot of publications on quality experience management and wine tourism. Thank, thank you, Mariana. Uh, so let's go to Dr. Minghui Huang, uh, the incoming editor-in-chief of Journal of Service Research. Good morning, everyone. It is really very early morning. I hope you all have woken up. Okay, my name is Minghui Huang. Uh, I'm a distinguished professor at National Taiwan University in Taipei. And uh, I, my background, I'm very international and also multidisciplinary. Uh, that can be shown that I actually, I am, I'm in the information management department, but I have done a lot of research in marketing and in service. I'm also currently I'm a fellow, a last a lifetime fellow of European Marketing Academy EMAC, an international research fellow uh, of Center for Corporate Reputation, University of Oxford in UK. And in the US part, I'm a, distingu a distinguished research fellow for of University of Maryland. So that really shows that's that is also the positioning of general service research that is very multi multidisciplinary. And it is also is is very uh, global and international. So that would be my brief background. Thank you, thank you, Minghui. And next we have Dr. Levent Altonai, the editor of Services uh, Service Industries Journal. Um, good afternoon and good morning, good, af uh, good day, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are, whatever you are doing. And I hope you are safe and healthy during these challenging times. Before I introduce myself, I would like to quickly thank the organizers for creating this, such a wonderful platform for knowledge transfer and scholarship internationally. Um, I know that there, 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 there are more than 2,000 people who already registered. That's an excellent opportunity for us to learn from each other. And it's extremely important looking into the future. Myself, Levent Altenai, Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship, Oxford Brookes University, editor of the Service Industries uh, Journal. Uh, my research areas of interest, entrepreneurship and, and strategic alliances in particular, how entrepreneurs start up and grow their businesses and how uh, strategic uh, alliances are formed internationally. Um, looking at my work, very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary in, in nature and quite international in the way I tackle the, the subject areas. And my work has been published in journals, including Journal of Business Research, International Small Business Journal, Journal, Journal of Small Business Management, Tourism Management, Annals of Tourism Research, and, and, and so on. And I co-edited a strategic management, entrepreneurship, and research method textbooks, a, 
I serve on the editorial boards of uh, more than 12 journals. I'm not going to mention the names, just uh, quickly uh, thinking about some of them, Journal of Business Research, uh, uh, Tourism Management, Journal of Services Marketing. Um, in terms of my uh, esteem and, 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 and the representations in international uh, platform, I serve, uh, I served as a panel member for, for Hong Kong RAE in years 2014 and 2020. I am currently serving as, as a RAF panel member for business and management in the UK as well. Um, Ongoing projects quickly. Um, currently, I've got three projects uh, running and, 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 and in parallel, one of which is like your certain, I'm looking at how we could help refugees integrate to the host societies or why to the wider communities through entrepreneurial activities, as well as helping them to improve their well-being. The, the, the other uh, project I am doing is again very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary in nature, how, how we could tackle uh, loneliness and, and social isolation among the elderly through helping them to use social spaces, either in retail store or in hospitality uh, spaces that, that, that they could utilize and, 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 and be part of the wider community. And the third one is funded by British Council, uh, very, uh, very much looking at how we can empower women through entrepreneurship in developing countries. Thank you very much in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And then last but not the least is the editor of Journal of Service Management and one of my academic role models, uh, Dr. Jay Kandampuli. Jay? Uh, thank you, Sardin. Thank you, Jihan, also for, for inviting uh, all of us, uh, including me, uh, into this panel. And thanks to all of you who are attending this uh, session. Um, uh, about myself, um, I'm a professor of service management at Ohio State University. Um, and my interests, uh, just like many other people, are multi. Um, but my passion is in service. Uh, I worked for nearly 13 years in the industry before I went to grad school. Uh, and therefore, I like to see uh, the blend of service theory in practice. And now that means you know, wherever we are teaching, we need to see how that can be applied to our students. Um, and therefore, um, my focus has been um, in various uh, evolving areas of uh, what the industry need, uh, and therefore uh, the benefit for the theory as well. Um, I don't know whether I need to say more um, I'm passionate about a lot of things, and one of the greatest things I'm passionate about is young researchers. Uh, I will do anything and everything uh, to help and support young researchers. I've created a, a organization called IRSSM, um, which has been over the last 10 years of uh, travel to 10 different countries. Uh, um, majority of the conferences, unfortunately, as, as we all know, uh, are focused in developing country or developed countries or in Europe, North America, all those places. But very rarely people from developing countries find, you know, are able to come to these countries because they are expensive. So my idea was to take the service research into other countries. And it has been very, very successful. These are not conferences. These are helping, guiding, supporting uh, young researchers um, for multiple reasons. And there are groups of people who have helped me over the last 10 years, and it's been very, very successful. Uh, so that is my passion. My passion is helping young researchers um, motivate to do service research. Um, so starting Right from the beginning, there are undergraduates, there are graduate students, um, all those people who are part of this IR system. Thank you. 
Thank you, Satan, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. So at the beginning, I will have some questions for all of our panelists, uh, but then I will have a specific question for each one of them as well. So let's start with the first question. Uh, as editors of different journals, you're in a very unique position because you get to see the papers way before they are published in journals so that everyone can read them. So based on the submissions that you have received in your journals recently, what do you think are some of the new and emerging service research themes that the service researchers are working on in the near future? So who wants to go first and we can take it from there? What are the some emerging new service research themes that you are seeing that are coming up? Jay, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably start. Uh, I'm sure others can join as well. And, um, I think well-being is becoming in a much, much well discussed, talked about. Uh, people are, everyone is interested in the well-being of everything, not just not just ours, but the whole society. Uh, the social well-being, the social innovation, uh, those are all things that are really coming up. Innovation, particularly. Uh, also is innovation in, in multiple attitudes so or ways of course technology AI all those kind of things as well uh, yeah I'll let the others speak Mariana or Mingue okay yeah uh, actually we have done a, a war a, a word cloud uh, about all the papers uh, submitted and published in JSR and we found three major three major themes technology, customer, and the change, the three. And the three really reflect uh, uh, nicely about uh, the important societal issues. And uh, I think some <laughs> in one of the questions that we are supposed to discuss, technology really play a very important role in service research. And we may, con we may be concerned about whether that is too much, but actually the positioning of the of JSR or the emerging thing is really technology, technology is everywhere. There's nothing we can avoid, but it simply is about how do we want to position technology in our better understanding about customers and about change. And so even for JSR, we have two uh, special issues. One is about frontline in change that's really capture what happened right now. And also another special issue is AI service and emotion. And one of the uh, important paper that we are under, under reviewing now is really about well-being. So well-being is really an important topic because we want to understand the well-being impact of service. And we also want to pay attention, emphasize customers' well-beings. So I think those are very important trends that I agree with Jay that we we do have a more emphasis on well-beings, but we want to we also incorporate, incorporate the role of technology. Yeah. how technology can increase customer well-being in the changing world. Yeah. Thank you. By the way, for our uh, audience, ming -Hue's new book with Roland Grass called Feeling Economy is a real great read, ming -Hue. So, you know, I highly recommend it. It's a great uh, book. Mariana, you want to add something to what Jay and ming -Hue just mentioned? Um, well, I will not add any new topics, but I would like to emphasize or to mention from my part as editor of two journals. Um, I edit Journal of Service Theory and Practice and Journal of Tourism and Hospitality Management. Um, indeed, we have seen an increased uh, number of submissions related to COVID. Uh, this is not new. It has been going on for the last one year and a half. Unfortunately, I wouldn't say that I have read or I have seen many papers that they have proposed or they are investigating new themes. Um, what even I have heard before, it's something uh, that reflects what my journals have received as well. People are researching more uh, in terms of how technology can enable this touchless or contactless uh, service society because of the obvious uh, security and health issues. Um, they are interesting about uh, well-being, but also topics about sustainability, responsibility, social corporate responsibility, and all these buzzwords that, again, they are not new. 
um, sustainability issues, well-being issues, um, transformative research, um, the role of technology, AI, they pre-existed before COVID. What COVID has actually done is to accelerate and magnify the need that we need to apply or research them. Um, and that's what uh, is actually happening. Um, so um, I wouldn't say I have seen anything new. Um, on the contrary, unfortunately, and I would imagine this applies again to many journals, um, I have seen many studies that I would call it replication studies. Um, many research that was really premature or research that basically tried to retest existing theories, how to become resilient, how to enable change, how to manage a crisis, um, how a crisis affects well-being of employees or the mental or decision-making or risk issues of consumers. Sorry, I don't need another crisis to reconfirm what I already know. Um, <laughs> so I'm still eager to see research that it will really uh, go beyond uh, what we already know or try to uh, contribute something really new and help the industry and the academia to progress a, a step beyond what we had been doing so far and we ended up to where we are now. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Levent, you want to add something to what was Yes, certainly. If I may, I would like to, to put your question into a context. And I've been doing some reading a, a, a lot. Um, some reading around chaos theory recently and trying to understand the, the, the transformation of the different sectors of the service industries through chaos theory. And that, that, is a, that has given me a different and an interesting perspective in the sense that I would like to use the, 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 the analogy of the, the butterfly and, and the COVID uh, with the ripple effect, well, as, as the butterfly moves its wings, you can see the implications and different implications of the COVID for the different sectors of the, the, the economies for a portion forcing a, a service industries to trans transform themselves and interesting things are emerging and and that is a, that, that these things are actually being reflected in the submissions recently one of which on one hand you see a, a, the, the, the the shifting consumer behaviors how 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 are they shifting and how are they changing the first thing is um, health and safety concerns are dominating every aspect of our lives and every aspect of um, uh, consumers' lives. And you can see changing consumer behaviors in the sense that um, Mariana and Ming already mentioned more use of technology, online shopping, and so on. But there are risks to be managed in terms of their health, and, and that needs to, to, to be look, uh, looked into. Now, that let's put that on one side on on the other side we can, we are seeing the early signs of revenge consumption and and overconsumption and and just to give you any a specific example what happened in china the day the lockdown was lifted many chinese lifted to the branded shops to uh, reward themselves after a, a long period of staying indoors. And, and I'm sure all of us, if you think about it, we all say, okay, once this lockdown is lifted, I will be traveling somewhere. I will be do buying something for myself. So people felt so much constraint that it has come to a point now, the day um, pandemic is over or is about to ease, I've got a feeling that there will be a, a revenge shopping and overconsumption. Now, if we think about this from the employee's perspective, which is important, and, and in terms of their well-being as well, now there are employees who are jobless nowadays because the businesses went bankrupt. And, and, and also they, get, they don't get full, salar full salaries because they work shifts. And, and, but on the other hand, if you ask people, and this is based on some, some scientific evidence, there are many people who say, well, I don't have to earn more, a, a lot, but I would, be have a, I would be happy to have a better quality of life. 
Now, if we bring all these down to the root of, uh, or the, to the idea of what are the topics that, that people are looking into recently, I would say well-being, definitely. But the, not only the well-being of the, the, the consumers, but also the well-being of the frontline employees. And I would be very interested, for example, to know what is happening in India when they are dealing with the, the, the health crisis. And, and, and that is important for the other destinations to learn, as well as in Italy and in Spain. That's one. The second uh, topic I would be, uh, uh, I will, I've been receiving and, 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 uh, papers and, and people looking to is health-centered innovation. And what I mean by health center in innovation, meaning how we can um, help different sectors of the service industries improve the health infrastructure so that we can create a safe uh, transaction zone for the um, for the uh, consumers. One example, a specific example I would give here, people already started looking at vaccination and its implications for the different sectors of the service industries. So if you are vaccinated, what, what, would you feel more safe? What, how would it in, uh, influence your intention to, to, to do shopping? The other area I would be, uh, I have been looking into and also receiving uh, papers on is ethical leadership and transformative leadership. Now we will need that. Leadership will play an inf influential role in shaping the future agenda, in influencing the, the, the business sector. So people already looking into this. The other area which is extremely important and people, especially doing policy re studies in relation to services, looking into that, inequality. Inequality always uh, existed in the world, but it is getting that that gap is getting bigger. Imagine only three percent of the population so far has been vaccinated. So this creates a already inequality between nations, among the communities, among the, the, the groups and the societies. That's another area. I'm not going to mention technology because people already talked about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all those. Um, very quickly, um, can we talk about a little bit of the challenges that the service and in retail researchers are facing today uh, in terms of data collection, methodology, or what are some of the challenges that we need to be aware of and we need to be prepared? Who wants to take it um, first? Jay, you want to go? We cannot hear you, Jay. No. Jay, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Now I think we can. Okay. Okay. So, service research has been a problem, in my view at least, is because most of the service research is done at, at the higher level, at master's or even PhD uh, at levels. And uh, very, very few universities teach undergraduate students services, unfortunately. And therefore, um, research as such, um, it's, it's, they, they, are, they are not understanding, they are not seeing the potential of service research until much later in their life. Uh, and so, from that onwards, what I'm trying to say is that because we, you know, we have not been trained to think using service as our basic mindset, we are not really seeing how service research can be conducted. And therefore, we are getting stuck with the data, we are getting stuck with the, the traditional methodologies that we have used and all those kind of different things. And it, it may not be the right answer that you're asking, but I feel that there is a problem there. Even today, if you look into even any country look into at undergraduate level service research, very, very little. Mm -hmm. Most countries, I would say. Yeah. Mariana? If I may... Uh, it's a very general question and they, there are many issues to be addressed. I will try to uh, highlight some of what I think are the most important. 
Um, service researchers, they are many and varied. Um, many of them, they are in different stages. For those that they started their PhD research before COVID, I would imagine their major dilemma now is what do I do? Do I need to change topic because it's not valid anymore? Uh, some of them, they might have started uh, data collection already and they might have to stop or they might not be able to collect more and they might need to revise research questions before starting continuing to collect data. So problems of PhD students and scholars in service research, I think, are really critical and they might be in a trouble situation. Um, if we are talking about early careers or even mid-careers, I think their major problem at this stage is that particularly if they are not well connected and people do not know them, they haven't presented their research, they don't have the research networks, uh, how are they going to collaborate and do research? They were already one year and a half locked down. They haven't been to conferences, they haven't met anyone. I wouldn't say that the online conferences are a good substitute to form relationships, to build trust and to uh, have people to collaborate with, to do research. So I really feel for them. They are in a really troubled situation. Uh, mature researchers, yes, they don't have this dilemma. Uh, probably the problem they might be facing um, is reduced funds for research particularly for universities that their budgets have been cut uh, since overseas students are not existent. Um, many service industries, particularly in tourism and hospitality, as you can imagine, they have no money to survive, not to mention money to fund research. Uh, so funding for research is a major issue uh, for all researchers, not just the uh, early or uh, mature ones. Um, Service research, I tend to believe that um, it has to be multidisciplinary. At least COVID has shown us that uh, we really need to learn from disciplines like criminology, diplomacy, politics, um, medical research. Now, how do you establish again networks and meet with people and you network to progress research? You're in the lockdown when you cannot travel, when you cannot present your views. So these are quite, I think, critical current issues for research in services. Yeah, thank you. Lament or Minghua, do you have something to add? Um, oh, yes. No. I, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, don't go ahead. No, 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 please, Ming, please, please. I <laughs> okay. Uh, what I observe the major challenge now is I think as the field, the service research field become more mature, we seem to encounter a similar problem like many uh, top journals as JSR become one of top journals. That is the research topic tend to become emphasized too much on rigor. We see a lot of papers really, really emphasize rigor, but the relevance, the relevance and the impact tend to be trivial. And I, I see that is an uh, important trend these days for the, all the submissions, to the J, a lot of submissions to the JSR. And the, actually what we want to see, and I think that's a challenge to the service field that it's important for service research to emphasize service uh, implications for stakeholders. Those stakeholders including service customers, researchers, managers, or uh, policy makers, uh, we want service research to have real impact to the society, to all the, all the different uh, stakeholders. Uh, instead of just a, a paper that addresses a very small issue, be because it's easier to be rigorous to be rigorous for this kind of research. So that I would think actually that can be, that, can, that is a, a major challenge that we need to deal with is that uh, don't let service research become another uh, another field that really just focus on publishing, publishable papers that emphasize on rigor instead of yeah. impact. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mingo. Levant, very briefly. Very briefly, without uh, repeating what Mariana and Ming, Ming have, have just said, 
just to, to build up on what they, they said, I mean, we have got two issues here, one of which is um, when it comes to training of our PhD students, we, we, we are asking them to review the existing literature, review the theories, um, and, and most of the time in the case of many students, PhD students, graduates, the point of departure to identify a research gap has always been the theoretical area or conceptual review. Now it has come to a point that, that we, we need to, I mean, we have already started, but we need to place more emphasis on the, the global challenges that the world is, uh, is uh, facing and how these students could make their topics uh, groundbreaking, that was Mar Mariana's point, and also timely uh, as it comes to responding to the, to the needs of different stakeholders, including policymakers, um, destinations, managers, and, and so on. Now here, I think one, one area which is extremely important, and I would like to, to underline that as well, is that it, when it comes to dealing with the global challenges of the world, it has come to the point now that there is no way but we will have to make our research multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. What does that mean? We will have to work closely with the health scientists, work closely with the, the chronologists, psychologists, and, and so on, in order to be able to um, train our students and also uh, produce a research output of, of some value. Now here, PhD programs. Now, when it comes to PhD programs and PhD training, I think it's extremely important now to make it um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mariana, if I can go back to you, um, you know, you just mentioned some of the challenges, uh, but since you are working on travel hospitality field, what do you think are some of the key opportunities waiting for those researchers in your specific field? Um, opportunities for research or for research, investigative? For research. Okay. <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, the industry um, has been challenged by three major topics even before COVID, um, sustainability, responsibility, and all these um, issues related with the environment or uh, the responsibility of tourism to the society. Uh, the increasing role and impact of technologies in the tourism, hospitality, and travel sector. And we have seen a lot of research on transformative tourism in terms of how it can help improve well-being, not only to tourists, but also to local communities, countries, regions, you name it. Mm -hmm. So these topics were already important because of COVID. Uh, everyone has realized that they have become even more important. Um, what I would, however, uh, recommend for researchers that they would like to progress that field is, as I said, to try to conduct research that it will probably challenge our all pre-assumptions. So just to mention some, uh, we have been for long, for example, made the pre-assumption that um, uh, tourism development is the only way to achieve uh, development um, in some way in a society. Well, we can achieve development even without growing the numbers of tourists or without making more investments. You can simply change the nature of tourism or the activities that people do. Um, we really need to uh, change mentality in terms of how we measure success in tourism. It was basically in terms of numbers again. Um, we haven't measured success in terms of well-being or happiness um, or in terms of social cultural sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, we have made the pre-assumption that um, capitalism and uh, personalization is unstoppable. Um, <laughs> that everybody has to personalize, use data, invade privacy, um, introduce more technology to become a better company to provide better service. Well, why this is true? Why you can't do it in a different way? So I think um, 
the topics, as I mentioned, they haven't changed. What the researchers need to do is to think differently and probably use different paradigms or different methodologies. Levin mentioned house theory before. There are many others. Uh, paradox theory. And we have seen many paradox that they do exist. You know, people, for example, saying, no, I'm not going to agree to cookies and uh, to give my personal data. And then they're downloading mobile tracing apps. And then they agreed to be tested for COVID and because otherwise they will not be allowed to go to office to work. Well, this is a paradox. You can't claim X and then do Y. Um, we can't claim that, you know, uh, we agree on travel mobility restrictions and they agree that we are democratic or we believe on, I don't know, whatever politic ideology. So um, I would advise again, um, open up our minds, um, think anti-disciplinary, not even multidisciplinary, um, to go beyond what we know. Okay. I or like create that. more than what we know and we don't know it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like what you just said at the end, Mariana. Thank you. Minghui, I will ask the question probably many have in their minds. So you are the incoming editor-in-chief of Journal of Service Research. So can you please tell us very briefly about your vision for the journal? You know, where the journal is going to go uh, under your editorship? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the vision, my vision is, uh, for, although I'm incoming, my term uh, officially starts from June, July 1st, but actually we are starting process new submissions from May 1st already. So if you submit a paper to JSR, it will be me to handle it. And our, our vision is we want to be a leader and continue to be a leader in the service community. And in the broader service community means it includes service research, service marketing, service consumer, service management, and service science. And so the positioning is, our position is a leader a leading service research journal. It's not just, it's just not a service marketing journal. It's multidisciplinary. Although we have very, very strong, uh, strong support from service marketing, but uh, we are more than that. And uh, that is real position and our vision. And uh, our scope, we are a global journal, not a just not just a US journal. Uh, that can be also be shown in, in, in the submissions. Our submissions come from 30, more than 30 countries around the globe and the impact. As I mentioned earlier, we want to publish, we want to publish impactful research that really answering important and unsolved questions, not just small gaps in the literature. That is also part of training we should have to our doctoral students that just don't, don't identify a small gap in literature and uh, try to do a very rigorous research that is not enough. You need to answer um, important questions, unsolved questions, and uh, make, your, make, your, uh, make your research has uh, real implications has really impact to the society or to any or multiple uh, stakeholders. And uh, I think another challenge that Brianna uh, uh, also mentioned is really data. Data is the issue. Nowadays, data represent, represent an opportunity, but they also a major challenge to us that how can we use multiple methods, multiple sources of data uh, to really uh, generate impact for research. So that, that is my vision about JSR, to be the leader, continue to be the leader in the service community and be a service research journal around the globe and the multidisciplinary that publish papers, use multiple methods, multiple sources of data uh, to have a real impact for multiple stakeholders. Thank you, thank you. No doubt that you will do a great job and we are all very much looking forward to JSR's new vision under you, Minghui. Jay, you. quickly, we talked about technology, but some colleagues say that we are focusing too much on technology while ignoring human science. What do you say about that uh, briefly? Is that the valid concern or how should we handle that? I suppose, you know, um, technology is there to stay. Okay. Uh, we can't avoid, we cannot not have technology and, and we have got used to it and uh, technology is a supporting help for us. Uh, so as long as we are serving people, we have to focus on people. Uh, if we serve technology, then it may be a little different or if we serve robots, if, or, then it might be a little different. But as long as customers are going to be humans, uh, we have to find ways to connect with the human and technology in one form or another. 
and not underplay the human component uh, when you want to serve a customer who is human. So uh, that is my take of it. And of course, you know, companies, organizations, of course, they would employ you know, all kinds of technology to, to you know, improve their profitability. Yes. If that is our goal, then that's a little different. Okay. Thank you, Jay. And final uh, question before we go on to audience question. Levant, you already mentioned uh, some recommendations for young researchers, PhD students. Is there anything that you want to add for our um, audience who are PhD students or early career researchers? Maybe one or two recommendations for them? Yeah, um, just a couple of uh, recommendations quickly. Again, and one is about the, the creativity and in the identification. We, we are not after a replication, we are after groundbreaking new ideas. And I would very much encourage PhD students to, to think along these lines, especially if they, 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 they would like to make a, a, a plan for their careers and, 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 and demonstrate an opportunity for career progression. Because the topic you identify would to some extent determine how you would progress with your career. If you are uh, identifying a timely topic, contemporary topic, that would open doors for you. And the way to go forward about this, like we mentioned earlier on, make it more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. If you don't have this, uh, if you don't have the, the criminology background, psychology background, sociology background, collaborate, but collaborate with the, the, the right people. When it comes to collaboration, uh, networking is a, a extremely important to, uh, in order to be able to get to know people. Is it a challenge nowadays? Yes, it is a challenge. We need to place more emphasis on social net, uh, networking, but we have to do it. Um, flexibility and adaptability is extremely important. We cannot say, this, has what, this is what I studied for my PhD, Therefore, I will stick to this topic and I will never ever uh, open doors for alternative uh, when avenues for research. We can't do that. We need to be flexible and, 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 and learn to, to, to adapt. The other important thing, which, which I think is extremely important nowadays, especially post pandemic, it will be, it is important now, but it will be extremely important to know to learn from each other, from the experience of other countries, India, China, um, emerging economies. We will have to collaborate with the scholars out there in order to be able to internationalize uh, our output and, and make sure as, as well that, that we learn from each, with each other. Thank you. Thank you. And it's never too late to learn new things. You know, I'm a late bloomer in service research. I came to service late. And I'm so happy that I did. So these are my questions for you. Now it's time to turn to our audience. I know that there were a lot of questions so that we can ask some uh, questions. So the first question, again, please jump in uh, whenever you have something to say. For the emerging scholars to publish in your journals, do you suggest that they target special issues as opposed to submitting to regular issues? I would say regular issues. Regular issues, you say? Yeah. Any, Mariana, Minghua? Yeah, I would say, I would say regular issues too, because special issues, it, it, I think the chance for what you are working on right now fit into the theme of special issues is low. And that is a special requirement. That's why we want to have a special issue, because we have a special theme that we want to look at. And actually, so uh, continue, if you're ongoing, if you're doing, uh, continue your current research streams, I think submit to a regular issue, uh, actually chance is higher. Yeah, thank you. Levent? I would say both, um, simply because you asked an interesting question, Satan, which was about, based on the submissions, what do we see as the, the trends? Now, what is also interesting here, we as uh, the editors, uh, we are, uh, we are proactive in terms of uh, establishing new agendas and setting the new agendas and directions for the researchers. For example, Service Industries Journal already uh, uh, published a special issue on, on the well-being of consumers and, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, employees, edited, co-edited by Sergi 
Tunisia and, and Musa Uysal. This was a very interesting special issue. We already published a, a special issue on a refugee crisis and the service industries journal. So the, the, the answer here is, yes, you can have a good chance of publishing in the regular issue, but if you really want to be proactive with us, with the editors, and, and we will be giving you some, some time to, to get your ideas together and, and think things through, do follow these special issues because they are more forward looking and, 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 and sets you a direction in terms of the, the focus. Yeah. Thank you. Mariana, you have something? Um, I will say the issue doesn't matter. What really matters is what is the topic of research and if the topic fits either the special issue or the journal title or focus. Mm -hmm. uh, the question to me, it seems that people think the other way around. They think of a journal and then they write uh, for a paper. No, I think you really need to decide the study that you do and then try to find where it's appropriate to publish it. Uh, otherwise, you just publish to publish or you do research to increase your metrics and publications. I'm not into that, sorry. Thank, thank you, Mariana. Uh, the next question is an interesting one, and I, I heard it uh, many times. Many editors say that uh, they value qualitative research. However, a big majority of articles published are quantitative. So what are your thoughts about qualitative research? The good old big dilemma, you know, so what are your thoughts about qualitative? Jay? Yeah, I mean, I think we all have this uh, uh, challenge. Uh, we unfortunately live in, in a world where uh, there need to be some way of quantifying something. Uh, and it is not always easy to jump into, you know, I'm not saying qualitative uh, research is not good. I'm only saying if you are a young researcher, uh, it might be better not to go into qualitative research because you might find a lot of challenges to convince the viewer that what you're doing is better. Um, so I would not recommend to you no, I'm not saying qualitative research is not good. I'm saying that, unfortunately, is much more thought, you know, you, you need to put a lot of time and effort into it. If you have a lot of good support, a lot of people who have done those things before, then go for it. Not otherwise. I, I would recommend what Minjan was, uh, you know, just saying uh, that mixed method is the best way. Uh, all methodologies have got their own challenges or problems. Yeah. So uh, mixed method will help you uh, definitely and, and, and multiple contexts as well. Don't go into one context. Use multiple contexts and multiple methodologies to prove and show that your study is solid. Yeah, thank you. Minghui, what's your take on that? I, I agree. I actually published this is the plan, uh, the plan that the qualitative research is often encountered. And uh, even my, in my own experience, I can feel that qualitative research really is more difficult to get a consensus uh, among reviewers. And I think it's, it's part of the nature of qualitative research. That is, is, is relatively more subjective and the people tend to have different views. So I would not say that I want to say that uh, we don't accept or we don't accept qualitative researchers or acceptance rates for qualitative research is lower. But as Jay put it very nicely, it, you need to think about how to persuade, how to persuade viewers. And typically, if you have multiple methods, multiple sources of data, that's really a way, a way to persuade reviewers so that uh, you can convey, you can convey your idea about, about your result is objective. I think that's probably one of the concerns that typically people have. Yeah, 
Thank you, Mingo. Levent, you want to add something to that from your perspective? Yes, actually, that's a very, very interesting. I, I, I did both uh, qualitative and, and quantitative research, and I've gone through the process of, of getting my papers reviewed. And the ones I, I, I agree with, uh, Jay and Ming, the, the, the ones I struggle with to get it through were the qualitative papers. Why were why was the was it the case? Simply because reviewers, quite rarely so, looking for internal consistency, starting from the introduction all the way to the to the literature review analysis conclusions you got to to maintain the focus and and the exploratory nature of the, the qualitative research sometimes makes it difficult and and to 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 ensure that internal consistency throughout but the most importantly when it comes to analysis, and I remember it well, from one of my papers I accepted in and uh, published in Journal of Small Business Management. Reviewers continue, uh, continue to question the data analysis. They are looking for more transparency, more detail in the way how the data analysis work in, in, in practice, quite rightly so. And that might become frustrating sometimes. It, it, it is, this is very much like um, getting a, a, a full bottle of oil, olive oil from a, a single olive. And that is a challenge. And, and, and you got to squeeze, constantly squeeze things to be able to constant, uh, convince the, the reviewers and and that is a challenge. And if you have the patience, commitment, time to go through it, yes, go for it, because qualitative research can really generate new and interesting insights. Yeah. Marianne, you have something to add to say, or should I? Uh... Uh, well, I won't repeat what is already said. Uh, you re somebody will really need to fit the methodology to the research question. Mm -hmm. So it's not an issue of selecting what editors or journals like. Uh, you really need to apply whatever appropriate methodology is for you. I think the uh, nature of the question emerges from the fact that, unfortunately, still to a certain extent, many top-ranked journals, particularly from USA uh, or based in USA, they value more quantitative research. And unless if you have sophisticated numbers and statistical analysis, you are not being accepted. Uh, I want to believe that journals are more open to different methodologies, uh, particularly the qualitative, that they have not been that popular that, um, that far. One of the reasons for that is not just journal editors or preferences um, or journals. I think it also has to do with reviewers. Many reviewers are not comfortable to review papers that they are qualitative because they're not familiar with the methodology. They don't understand or they, for them it doesn't make sense. So to a certain extent, I believe that uh, to achieve a change, we really need everyone to be educated, editors, yeah. reviewers, researchers alike. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The next question, in fact, I kind of, we all found ourselves in that position. It's almost like a yes, no question. I've submitted an article to a journal and get desk rejected. I know my paper is good. Do you think I should spend time and write a response to the editor to change his or her opinion? <laughs> Jay, you're laughing. What do you say? <laughs> no, I'm saying, no, there, uh, really, if an editor uh, uh, didn't get impressed by reading you know, the front end of the paper, uh, I, I think it, it'll be, it, there, there must be a reason. There must be a reason. Yeah. Um, so then convincing a reviewer would become much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So uh, please don't try to do that because I, I, they are not, nobody to really punish anyone. And, and, and nobody will do that. Yeah. No. Uh, editors get rewarded for publishing, not not publishing. So yeah. if it is good, they will find a way to publish it, yeah. help you, support you, and, and guide you to with the reviews and whatnot. And, and so please don't question them. They are, they are really there to help you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else who want to add something to that? Because we may have made one more question during the time. Meanwhile, Levin, Mariana, 
Yeah, I can respond to this question because this is a very interesting one. There are several points, like I mentioned first. It's very common for death rejection these days. I think for JSR, uh, our death rejection rate probably is about 50%, five zero. So don't get frustrated because that's very common. And it also have authors who have quick turnaround because many, there are many reasons of the death rejections. And the second point I want to make is I know my paper is good. I, I love that because you, you do need to have belief in your own papers. If you don't even believe your papers, there's no way that reviewers can like it. I do I, I do think that is very important. But the key thing is, uh, especially what we are doing right now, we are doing in, in JSR is, I ask myself and our our editor team that you cannot, when you do the desk rejection, you cannot just say, oh, the paper is lousy, it's not good enough. That is not responsible to authors. You, even if, even if for desk rejection, you need to state the reason you need to provide your own evaluation about why you think the paper should be death rejected. So that really paper, the author have a chance to respond. Yeah. But you need to respond in a way that the editors will think, okay, it's a death reaction, but you may have the chance to resubmit. So it's not to be, it, will, it can be, you can turn a death rejection into a reject and resubmit. But the key is you actually need to be yeah. incorporate incorporate the comments you cannot just say i believe my paper is very good so i just do nothing and uh, just want to challenge the editors because editors would actually spend time on reading your paper even if unfortunately the result is less rejection but last question probably given the time this is also interesting maybe mariana Le Levin, you may want to say something editors say that impact factor is not a measure of quality in journals but the first thing that they mention their journal is the impact factor so why is this contradiction? Okay, uh, since you mentioned my name, I probably will start. Um, I will speak for myself. Uh, the rest can also speak for themselves. Uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, editors, academic scholars, they are within this game. The game is played by impact factors, um, and that's how we all try to increase our performance. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it matters how you measure your performance because this is what you become. Uh, so if you measure your performance by impact factors, that's what you highlight. Um, if um, authors and scholars are being assessed by impact factors, and this is what it will attract them to submit their quality research to journals. This is what the editors will emphasize. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the impact factor is not the only metric to show how good you are. Um, it's not a panacea, um, but this is how, unfortunately, everybody's success is being measured or um, people get promotions or journals get recognized. Yeah. Um, I want to believe the game is going to be changed soon or quickly because impact factors are not the uh, sole indicators that we should be worried, but that's how it is the current reality. Okay, so we have like one more minute. Who wants to say something about this? Levant, you want to add something? Yes, quickly, yes. Right. Um, Mariana mentioned um, impact factor is one performance indicator, but at the end of the day, what matters for the, at least for, for the, the service industry journal is how it can differentiate itself from the others. And, and that is extremely important uh, for, for, for us. And, and our benchmark is ourselves in this regard. And what do I mean by that? we have been trying to to uh, set our own performance targets in the sense that we decided to tackle social issues that mean a lot to the rest of the world and and therefore we have been encouraging authors as well as uh, editing special issues on on topics which would have social outcomes so dependent um, variable will be social out outcomes and this could be just before we mentioned well-being 
refugee crisis, informal economy. There is a lot there that, that we, we haven't looked at collectively as service researchers in terms of how we could uh, help those, th those ones or how we could offer insights into those areas where people are actually suffering, not getting properly paid, not proper uh, making proper living for themselves. So for service industries journal, one of the, 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 the performance indicators is yes, it impact factor performance indicator which we set for ourselves and that is our benchmark is to uh, keep social issues high on the agenda very quickly also yes no question what are your thoughts on using crowdsourcing as a data collection method like nterk or qualtrics it's an easy way to collect data but is it valid what's your thought on such kind of data collection thumbs up thumbs down <laughs> yeah, I'm, no, there's a lot of challenges with that because we do not know who's, who's answering those questions uh, and therefore the reliability is going to be low. Okay. Anyone else want to add maybe a different perspective? Maria? Uh, yeah, I might question mark with this technique again it has to do with um, really ability of data we really don't know who is behind it uh, i have no idea if it is just a manufacturer industry to sell uh, fake profiles and responses uh, and if there is an alternative way to do research i would prefer that <laughs> okay. thank you so I have 831, it means we are a minute over our time, but it was a real pleasure. It was a real uh, privilege to be part of this panel. Thank you, Mariana. I know it's a different, very different time zone for you there. Thank you, Minghui, uh, for being with us today. Levent, thank you, good afternoon. And Jay, uh, it's always great to see you. And I hope our audience enjoyed this panel and they learn from what you share with them. And Jihan, thank you for giving us the opportunity being part of this panel today. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.